interviewing one of the authors of Branding Means Business today on the podcast, and I cannot wait to share this conversation with you. As a brand builder, you've probably wondered, if you're anything like me, how you build a lasting brand while still molding and adapting to the current context and market. We talk about that tension or that contradiction on today's episode, along with a lot of other topics that I know you are going to love. Matt is a man after my heart. He is researching, he's in the trenches, codifying and actually leading the science in a lot of the things that I teach and that I share with my students and my clients as a brand strategist. Matt Johnson, PhD, is a speaker, researcher, and writer specializing in the application of psychology and neuroscience to marketing. Following his PhD in cognitive psychology from Princeton University, his work has explored the science behind brand loyalty, experiential marketing, and consumer decision-making. He's the author of the best-selling consumer psychology book, Blind Sight, The Mostly Hidden Ways Marketing Reshapes Our Brains, that came out in 2020, and now Branding That Means Business, which was published through Economist Books in the fall of 22. As a contributor to major news outlets, including Psychology Today, Forbes, and BBC, he regularly provides expert opinion and thought leadership on a range of topics related to the human side of business. Matt is also passionate about helping brands use neuroscience to better understand, serve, and interact with their consumers. He's the founder of neuroscienceof.com, through which he consults with a wide variety of organizations, including an expert in residence with Nike. Matt currently resides in Boston, Massachusetts, where he's the professor of psychology and marketing at Holt International Business School and an instructor at Harvard University's Division of Continuing Education. Matt grew up in the Bay Area, California, and has lived and worked in San Diego, New Jersey, Berlin, and Shanghai. Let's dive in. Matt, I'm so excited to be talking with you today. For the unacquainted, can you give us a quick background of who you are? Sure. So my name is Dr. Matt Johnson. I'm a speaker, writer, and professor who specializes in the application of neuroscience to marketing. So originally, my academic background was in cognitive neuroscience. So my PhD focused on uh, the neuroscience of perception and communication, so how we go from sort of the raw sensory details in our environment, the sort of sights and sounds, and how we sort of take those in, our perceptual system interprets them, and then we sort of build these rich inner worlds, and then ultimately we're able to communicate these ideas. And so that was the focus of my uh, PhD work, and then right after that I actually went into the world of business consulting, and that was really where I discovered this sort of rich intersection between neuroscience and business, and particularly neuroscience and marketing. So that's been my uh, real sort of field and, and focus ever since. So I've written two books. Uh, Blind Sight was sort of written for the consumer on consumer psychology, and the most recent, uh, Brain That Means Business, is really about applying a neuroscientific, uh, specifically a social neuroscience perspective to uh, to brands. And so, uh, yeah, that, uh, that sort of brings us up to up to the current moment. Amazing. Amazing. I had the distinct honor and pleasure of reading your new book, Branding Means Business, in preparation for our call. And this is officially a book that I wish that I wrote. It is so well done. I've been calling myself uh, the psychology-driven brand strategist for a long time. So we have a lot in common in terms of how we're approaching the brand equation, and I can't wait to learn more from you. This is going to be amazing. Um, you open the book right away with talking about how so many people are focused on the future, like the things that are changing, the trends, the what's coming next. But you pose a alternative, which is to focus on the things that don't change. What turned your brain on to that perspective? How did you get focused on that area of looking at brands? So I think when we really get into the, the sort of science of branding, especially in, in B2C, it, it really comes down to sort of the fundamentals of, of psychology and the fundamentals of, of human nature. And I know I'm, I'm sort of speaking to the uh, preacher to the choir here uh, with the, the brand psychologist, but really if, if a brand is to connect, if it has an influence on, on somebody's purchasing decisions or on their likelihood of referral to a friend, anything that a brand manager can hope to care about, 
uh, the brand necessarily needs to make contact with something deep internal to the human being. And of course, humans are quirky, we're complicated, we're hypocritical, we're multifat, we're all sorts of things. Um, but we also are, are fairly consistent throughout time and place as well. And so uh, really the focus of this book was, you know, of course, we need to be future oriented. Of course, there's trends that we need to be sort of cognizant of as, as brand managers. But at the same time, we really need to be tethered to the fundamentals of, of human nature and also look at how those fundamentals of human nature really intersect with culture. Because I think that's a huge, mm -hmm. and I think, underappreciated element of branding. There's so many stories of brands that are so successful in their you know, specific region and their specific ways with the specific values and brand identifiers that they, uh, they, they sort of hold dear and they, they build and constellate in the mind of the consumer. And then they go to a different context. And if it doesn't connect in that context, it just doesn't connect, period. And so I think especially at the intersection of, of sort of human nature and culture, that's really rich exploration for, for brands. Yes. Yes. This is a totally silly example, but I like to say if you were building your brand in a zombie apocalypse, the context would be completely different. <laughs> You'd have a completely different business. And you have some really great examples in the book as well. Um, before we get into all of that, can you talk to me a little bit about the process and the research of actually writing the book? What did that look like? Sure. So yeah, it was really drawing from a, a number of different fields. So I, I think we sort of started the book with this this um, inspiration that the brands of today and going into the future uh, really can't just rely on the fundamentals of business. They really need to rely on these sort of more human fundamentals because, of course, everybody relies on the business fundamentals. And if you're just relying on the business fundamentals, then by definition, you're you're not differentiating. And so part and parcel of the branding process is this element of, of differentiation. And so um, really brands need to go above and beyond. There's, there's a whole host of pressures that modern brands are facing. Um, long gone the days of really being able to dictate unilaterally what I stand for as a brand. Gone are the days of everybody going home at 6 p.m. and turning on Walter Cronkite and Coca-Cola ads blasting and the brand being able to tell the consumer, the middle class consumer, that we represent happiness or Chevrolet, we represent Americana. Those days are, are long gone. It's a very fragmented media landscape. And brands sort of in this, this very fragmented and very porous media landscape, the brand no longer is sort of dictated by the corporation. The brand image in terms of what consumers come to understand about the brand really now more than ever is what consumers tell each other the brand is. And so it's much more porous than ever before. Uh, it, it's much more unilateral, it's much more bilateral. Uh, there's much more co-creation. And the brand managers that really felt that they were sort of the guardians of brand identity, really in many ways, I think really need to relinquish that control. And so that was sort of the major context that, that really drove the inspiration for writing the book. And so we really wanted to write a book that helped brand managers and marketers sort of rise to this challenge and by, by the research process then sort of moved to what are the sort of the key areas of, of intersect between branding business and human nature. And that was sort of my own field of, of sort of neuroscience and then uh, fields that are, are sort of um, tangential to it, uh, adjacent to it in, in terms of sort of social neuroscience, sociology, uh, interviewed a number of different anthropologists as well, which uh, is very helpful, uh, especially for what we were chatting about earlier with looking at this really important intersection of culture. And so really, I think bringing in these very human-based uh, sort of humanities fields into the world of branding was really the, the research process in terms of, of filling out that sort of integration. I mean, at the end of the day, as brand builders, we are trying to influence human behavior. So it only makes sense that we need to dive into these fields of study that have been studying and researching human behavior for so long and marry those two. And I love that you've done such a good job with that. As I was reading the book and you've touched on this just now, I feel like there's still a bit of tension in kind of two different ways. And maybe we speak to each of these separately or, or maybe it's the same conversation, but there's the tension between consistency, consistency of meaning, of, of showing up, of, of purpose, versus this co-creation that's happening with the people that are actually engaging with the brand. And then there's maybe similarly, or maybe it is separate. I feel like there's also a tension between a brand deciding what it stands for, but then the meaning only exists, as you say in the book, 
in the minds of the person that's buying it. So you really have to derive some of that meaning from the people that are are buying the brand. So what does a brand manager do with with those competing ideas? How do we stay consistent? How do we stand for something when we're also trying to engage with the market and learn from them and reflect back to them what really matters to them? It's a great question. It's a great question. I, I think this tension is really sort of the, the sweet spot of where excellent brands thrive and where sort of mediocre brands sort of fall to the wayside. And so I think really the fundamental question that brand managers need to ask is sort of which are our uh, sort of just unequivocal, just foundational principles and values as a brand, as an organization, and then which are we sort of more flexible about and, and we're willing to be sort of driven by in terms of our consumers. In, in other words, if we're looking at sort of classic market orientation, in which ways are we going to be sort of a, a market driving force? And in which ways are we going to be market driven? And so really when it comes to sort of the core purpose of the organization, not just the brand, but the organization, that really comes down to this element of, of sort of core purpose and values. And ideally, those really need to stay ironclad. Because um, mm. so if we're sort of trying to understand brand image and brand personality in the same ways that human beings come to understand personalities of their, their fellow humans, they really rely upon the same principles. And there's this essence that people have. They, you know, change their their fashion changes and their, you know, personality changes to a certain extent and their preferences change and they're into different things and they go through a goth phase versus a professional phase, all different phases of their life, but their essence sort of stays the same. And so as a, a corporation, as a brand, that essence needs to stay the same. If it fluctuates, if it changes, it becomes a completely different entity in the mind of the consumer. And more often than not, it just becomes diluted. It just basically stands for nothing. And so this sort of foundational purpose is, is really crucial. And then I think once that's well understood, and ideally that purpose really resonates with consumers in a really timeless uh, sort of paramount way, then the brand does have a bit more flexibility to look at what consumers are into and seeing the ways in which they're using the product, seeing which the ways they're perceiving the brand and exert a bit of flexibility about that if they, if they decide that that resonates ultimately with uh, the brand purpose. That being said, it, it's easier said than done because, of course, it, it's very tantalizing for a brand to sort of chase, you know, given trends or chase consumer preferences, especially as we get into uh, sort of political values and sort of ethical values and sort of the, the calls for brands to, to get more involved in uh, sort of, uh, politics and, and certain areas that the brand may not be comfortable in. And consumers are sort of calling for the brand to go into it. And if it doesn't resonate with the brand, then they really shouldn't just go along with consumer sentiment just because mm -hmm. that's what, what the market is telling them. So it's a really sort of fine tension, as you mentioned, between this is sort of who we are. This is our purpose. These are our values. But our consumers are telling us to do this. But we don't want to just be an automaton sort of dangling from the strings of consumer sentiment. We have to be our own entity as well. And that, again, is sort of this. This, uh, this, this tension that, again, is, is easier said than done to try and resolve. We're going to get right back to the interview. For the next few seconds, I'm going to share with you my brand, Clarity Collective, and how it can help you grow your income and impact. If you're an entrepreneur who feels stuck or uncertain about what makes your brand stand out, then this is for you. The Brand Clarity Collective is a mastermind multiplied by mentorship. It's part online curriculum, part digital mastermind, and it's designed to help you get crystal clear brand clarity so you attract more perfect clients and grow your business. We have a thriving community of entrepreneurs who are all smart and driven. As a member of the collective, you get an all access pass to all of my best branding courses, as well as access to our private community where you can connect with like-minded entrepreneurs and get feedback and support directly from me on our coaching calls. The Brand Clarity Collective is priced at just $2.97 per month. And after six months, you keep lifetime access to all of the courses. To learn more and to see if it's right for you, head over to my homepage at kputnam.com. There's a big section where you can click to learn more. I'll also include the link in the show notes wherever you are listening or watching. All right, let's get back. Yeah, so interesting. I think a really good example that you present in the book is around Axe Body Spray. 
I can't, I can't forget the parent name of their company, but Axe was essentially forced into a corner where they had to change the way that they were communicating their core values because the context had shifted, the society had shifted. Can you talk a little bit about that? Totally. So Axe Body Spray, um, most of your listeners will be familiar with it. Uh, Unilever, it's one of their their brands. That's right. And uh, if you look at their brand image now, it's very, very different than their brand image that was introduced in the 90s and early 2000s. Yeah. So if you look at the 90s, early 2000s, do you remember this, Kay? These, these yes, like, totally. Over-sexualized commercials. So they, yep. they, to their credit, they were very effective. So Unilever did the research, Axe did the research, and they found out that their, their core niche that they were going for uh, wasn't like the big confidence, you know, football player, popular kid in high school. It was like the nervous kind of shy kid that didn't know how to talk to people, didn't have a lot of friends, had a little social anxiety. Like that was their very clear consumer persona. And so these ads really focused on putting that person in situations where the product could be the hero and the brand could be the hero. So you'd spray a little bit of this Axe body spray and they'd be like, I don't, I'm embarrassed even to like describe it, but like they'd be this <laughs> like harem of like 30 cheerleaders just like chasing after him for like a mile. It'd just be like these, these yeah. crazy, like over-sexualized commercials. And you know, they were effective and they established part of Park and Fit, they were beloved within that consumer persona. Uh, but of course, our attitudes about gender norms, our attitudes about sexuality have shifted quite a bit between the late 90s, early 2000s, and now going into 2020. And Axe, to the credit, really nicely evolved sort of along with those trends, where if you look at Axe now, they've, they've really flipped the script and they've taught, they're still sort of targeting that same consumer persona, but targeting them now in 2020, uh, mid-2010s on, uh, in terms of you know more mature notions of, of masculinity and it's okay to be sensitive and it's the same concern persona the same social anxiety but now sort of the the, the cultural the, the cultural window the Overton window is sort of shifted for them and it's sort of speaking to them in a way that that's sort of culturally sensitive there so uh, yeah Axe is a great example of a brand that's sort of shifted along uh, with with cultural and sort of gender norms as those have changed as well. Mm, yeah, I feel, I thank you for presenting that because I think that's such a good example of a brand that's doing it well. I think there's a lot of brands that were incredibly hot and popular when um, I was in high school. I don't know how old you are, Matt, but um, I'm thinking of like Victoria's Secret and Abercrombie and there's been a big cultural magnifying glass that have been put on their practices both back then and how they continue to operate. And consumers are demanding different. They're demanding better. And some brands and some companies are navigating that better than others for sure. Um, yeah, there's a Definitely. hugely popular song by an artist named Jax that started on TikTok about um, Victoria's Secret. Are you familiar with it? No, no, I haven't heard that. Oh my gosh. Yeah, it's it's such a perfect encapsulation of the culture's response or like how we feel about those old ways that those brands used to, to market to us. So yeah, super interesting. Yeah. I won't get too far in the weeds there. <laughs> it's Amazing. It's interesting topic. I mean, I think yeah. one sort of almost sort of low hanging fruit for brands in order to establish product market fit and really to um, really to resonate with a target market is really to, to play into social identity. And identity mm. can revolve around something as, as simple as a gender identity. So you see it in the case with Axe, and these are sort of the, the stereotypes, uh, stereotypes sort of gender norms of like the, you know, the early, you know, 2000s. Um, you can going to have sort of gender norms in terms of, of female gender norms as well. And that can be, in a, you know, say what we want from like a, a sort of a moral standpoint, but it can be effective from a branding standpoint um, for the time being, for the short term. But of course, a brand only resonates when the values that it attaches to it resonates with that target market. And when those values, those culture values shift, the brand necessarily needs to shift with it or else it will look like a dinosaur effectively. So it can be effective in the short term. But then, of course, if you're not attaching yourself to anything sort of long term and, you know, paramount and, and sort of fundamental to human experience, if that changes, then you have to change along with it. I mean, there's a reason that like, Coca-Cola, you know, founded in the late 1890s, still has the same brand image, the same brand identifiers that it did back at its founding that it does today. Because happiness 
and tradition never go out of style. It's, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's no accident that if you look at like, you know, GoDaddy or, uh, you know, Victoria's Secret or Axe Body Spray that attach themselves to like cultural gender norms of an era, all of them have had to shift. So it's the mm. same general principle playing out in terms of, of attaching to an identity and attaching a set of values. Um, but one is sort of these are fundamental values to the human experience. Others are sort of, you know, they come and go as, as sort of, you know, culture comes and goes effectively. Yeah. Love that. So a lot of the people that watch this show or listen to this show are small business owners. And you are one of the first people that write about brand or that has written about branding that called out that difference that small brands and small businesses are actually perceived different and they br can brand different. And forgive me if I'm, I'm butchering this, but you notice that there's a difference between the two. Can you speak to that? How do small businesses brand differently than big businesses? So we have this one word brand, which has some consistent meaning if you're describing any <laughs> given brand, but really there, there's so many subgroups here. And when brands mm -hmm. think of these subgroups, they think of themselves um, you know, as a brand and they think about their brand identifiers, their brand image, they tend to think about it from their own perspective. So they see, how do we differentiate? Let's look at this competitive landscape and we can sort of see you know, the ways in which we're different from Pepsi and the way we're different from you know, root beer, et cetera, et cetera. But that's really not how most consumers view brands. They don't look at like, oh, I'm going to, you know, buy Coke instead of Pepsi or buy this instead of that. Uh, really sort of consumers see brands in terms of the brand image very differently depending on sort of their perceived size. And so this is this big distinction that we make in the book, which comes from this excellent research, RED Associates based in Copenhagen about small brands versus big brands. And they're perceived very, very differently. So small brands um, are, are perceived by consumers as having sort of a one-to-one uh, -one sort of human nature type of, of feel where you can sort of walk into the shop and they'll be flexible about this and that. And they don't have really strict, you know, refund policies. They're just, you know, you can really get to know them on sort of a one-to-one -one sort of empathetic level. That's the perception for sort of small brands. And it's worth pointing out that small brands are sort of defined by the consumer. So it's not sort of market mm. capitalization or revenue or cost of goods sold, anything like that. It's really defined by the consumer. So Ben & Jerry's, for example, despite being a massive company, another Unilever brand, it is perceived as, as still being a very small brand. I mean, Ben & Jerry's are perceived as like people you could just go up to Vermont and just hang out with. And those are sort of the expectations that people have for, for small brands. Um, even though it's a massive company that, you know, is, is you know, influenced by Unilever and all sorts of different ways. But from the consumer perspective, it does have that sort of empathetic feel. And so for small business owners, it's really important to really tap into that. So there's all sorts of advantages, of course, that big, massive corporate brands have. They're massively funded. They have incredible capabilities and infrastructure, but they don't have that, that empathetic feel as much as small brands do. And so that's one sort of piece of advice we try and give to small business owners is that that's your, that's your bread and butter. It's really resonating directly, empathetically with the consumer. And then as brands get bigger in the mind of, of the consumer, they become into the sort of big brand category and the expectations mm -hmm. are very different. So nobody expects to go to Nike or Coca-Cola and just chat with, you know, the board and chat with the CEO and recommend flavors. But they do have other expectations for those brands, which is that they want those brands not just to deliver excellent products and have, you know, catchy advertising. They want these brands to have a sort of world beating quality to them. So representing mm -hmm. something beyond business. So if you're you know, perceiving Nike, for example, you're not just a great athletic company, you know, you make dreams come true. If people are looking at Google, you're not just an incredible technology, hardware, software company, you know, you're making the world better through technology. And so sort of those are the expectations that consumers have of those brands. And so they, they sort of tend to converge onto brand images and brand identities, which have this sort of bigger sort of world beating quality to them. To me, it felt like a rallying cry for small businesses because you were highlighting all of the things that small businesses can do really well. Uh, one of them that you mentioned was you can be incredibly specific about the brand personality. You can have this narrowed identity. You don't have to try to be that worldwide phenomenon. You can just be who you are. Is there anything else that's uniquely 
advantageous or special about small business brands? So I'd say you know, certainly, as we, we mentioned, the, the level of empathy is, is uh, much stronger. And because that level of empathy is there, as you mentioned, you're able to really craft a personality which is much more nuanced, which is much more uh, sort of relaxed and subdued, and is much more catered towards a specific group of consumers. Uh, once you're a massive brand like Nike, you have to have a big brand image that attracts people from literally all over the world. And people from all over the world are attracted to this foundational idea of having your dreams come true. If you are a, a small bakery or a, a fashion brand or something very niche, you can craft a much more nuanced personality that is just for your people. And you don't have to feel the pull of, of having this sort of superordinate, sort of massive personality to sort of live up to. The other thing I would say as well, especially because you mentioned a lot of your listeners are small business owners, a lot of small businesses uh, unfortunately don't necessarily understand the true value of their products. It was just a fantastic report that came out in Axios looking at the effects of inflation. And of course, all businesses have felt the power of, of uh, effects of inflation and mm -hmm. uh, supply chain cost increases. Big businesses tend to do much better with inflation because they have all the data on price sensitivity and willingness to pay, and they can charge a bit more and they know their consumers are going to pay for it. Small businesses tend to count themselves out and they say, no one's going to buy this pie for $15. They've been buying it for $12 for 10 years. I've always priced it at $12. I can't price it at $15. You know, I'm just going to. And sadly, there were a couple of cases where uh, there was a pie shop up in Maine that like went out of business because they assumed customers weren't going to pay 20% more for a pie. And mm -hmm. they didn't, unfortunately, understand the true value of their products. And so uh, in, as soon as they shut down, there was this wave of emails and letters that they got. Oh, my God, I would pay $25 for a pie. I've been, you know, I loved your pies for decades now. But unfortunately, they had already let the, let the lease mm -hmm. go. Um, but it's just a lesson, a cautionary tale for really sort of understanding your true value as, as a brand, um, which I think is, is especially important for, for small brands. Oh, yes. You ha have a really great phrase or, or line in the book where you mentioned that having a really great brand is like playing the game of capitalism on easy mode. But you also have to remember to leverage that easy mode. It's like if you've done all of the work to create this amazing relationship with your with your community and with your people, you still do need to stay in business. Like you still need to have a profit margin. And that's such a great reminder to it, it feels icky to say it this way, but like to to leverage that brand, to continue to grow, to continue to impact more people and to continue to grow the relationship. So thank you. Thank you for for sharing that. Such a great reminder. Another thing that stuck out to me in the book was you talk about the rise of influencers and you, you talk about Jonah Berger's books as well, which I love, and the fragmentation of communication. So as a brand, we now have all of these tiny little micro communities and micro influencers. Something that triggered in my mind is, especially as entrepreneurs, as small business owners, we also have the opportunity to be one of those micro influencers. Can you talk about the effect that's happening as this trend is rising in the market? Sure. So this goes back to, to something we spoke about a little bit earlier with, with uh, the, the fragmentation of the media landscape. We went from sort of the 1950s, you know, it, it's a yeah. classic example, but everyone sort of, you know, went home and they watched Walter Cronkite. And like, that was the personification of like centralized media. Like everybody in America got the news from Walter Cronkite. And there was sort of analogous figures in Europe that had the same sort of centralized sort of power. And there was quite a lot of yeah. trust in relatively few media channels. And since the 1950s, it's gone in sort of one direction, um, both in terms of trust and in terms of fragmentation, where mm -hmm. uh, media organizations are far less trusted than they are anymore. And the media landscape has, has fragmented. And so now there's not four channels on TV, there's, you know, thousands of channels and there's, you know, incredibly new platforms as well, obviously with, with social media, which continues to evolve as we're seeing with TikTok and Be Real and, and lots of, of new platforms that are coming out. And so now people are getting their news and I'm defining news sort of broadly in terms of, of input that's sort of shaping their worldview, whether that's sort of consumer behavior or, or concepts of, of the world and the news and what's happening from a myriad of, of different sources. So as you write about in the book, sort of Walter Cronkite is sort of 
shattered into a million different pieces effectively. And each piece has a grasp on a, a narrow set of, of consumers uh, that, that really have that same degree of trust, but it's just much more niche and it's much more sort of catered for those specific individuals. So just as like the small brand has a very sort of well-defined and very curated and very nuanced personality just for their people, each influencer also has a very niche audience sort of just for them. And so yeah. I think there's a lot to say in terms of uh, sort of echo chambers and, and internet silos and, and sort of the difficulties of people getting news from all different sources and, and there's an effect of social media, political polarization. But I think just in terms of the communication landscape generally, um, what we're seeing is that there's much less ad spend going towards sort of massive macro influencers, the Kardashians, the Rock, you know, the, these big, the, the Paul brothers, these big massive influencers, yeah. and then more towards these sort of more niche influencers, these sort of more niche sort of micro and even a term that I learned in the writing of the book, nano influencers, which is, mm. you know, somebody with a, a following across channels of maybe 15,000 or 20,000 people. So it's not massive, it's a very humble following, but within that following, you have a lot of trust and you've cultivated a, a community that uh, is uh, is trusting of this individual and, and is, is very open to suggestions for products and brands, et cetera. And there are some studies showing, and then Jonah Berger's done some work here, which you mentioned, uh, showing that actually, you know, in terms of return on investment, if you know your audience well and you have very well-crafted sort of consumer segments, then sort of, you know, spending a dollar on nano influencers as opposed to a dollar on macro influencers is going to bring you a bit more return on investment. And so I think there's, there's generally speaking a bit more spend going towards these sort of nano influencers, especially as we're seeing these sort of more niche brands sort of rise up as well. If you're a Coke or a Nike or a massive brand, then of course, you know, you have a massive audience and you utilize the LeBron James and Serena Williams of the world. Um, but if you're a very, you know, a small brand coming up and you know your consumer persona is, is you know, very well defined and resonates with a certain type of, of influencer, then the nano route, um, at least the evidence up until this point, really suggests that it's much better return on investment. And I think that the mm -hmm. last thing to, to sort of say there is there's a huge rise, not just of sort of nano and micro influencers that are open to doing affiliate marketing and open to doing influencing for other brands, but there's a lot, this huge rise of sort of influencer led brands where it's, you know, yeah. you're establishing your audience on Instagram or on Twitter or wherever the case may be. And you have a following, you have a, you have a market, you have everything, but the product. And so then you, 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 you know, see what consumers like, you sort of, you know, offer some products, you, you know, offer, you know, some, some brand imagery, establish product market fit. And that can be, you know, it, you know, can be a, a successful sort of nano influencer led brand. So we're seeing that quite a bit mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, great opportunity for co-creation with your audience at that point too. If you already have an audience, you can create with them or alongside them and figure out exactly what they want from you. There's tons of examples of this. And a lot of my clients and students live truly like right in the intersection of those two things. The the rise of meaningful brands and then the rise of influencers. They're becoming influencers themselves to build brands. And it's just, yeah. it's such an interesting time. I love it. What impact do you hope that your book has on the world of business? So I think something we, we spoke about quite a lot in this show is the, the small businesses. So I think, you know, corporations, brands, um, you know, they, they have a lot of advantages to them. Of course, they feel, you know, massive amounts of pressure with inflation and, and geopolitics. But I'm pretty confident, you know, these, these massive corporations, they'll figure it out. But I think what really uh, is, is my hope for the book is that the, the content here will be really helpful for the small businesses and the small brands. So I think we're, we're very lucky in the past 10 years to sort of see the birth and the evolution of some incredible new brands. So we have Glossier, we have Lululemon, we have some incredible new brands that have sort of liquid debt, which is, you know, the yeah, sort of go-to example for a well-differentiated right. brand. I mean, instead of product market fit, it was brand market fit. We put the brand out there before you even had a product. Um, and, and we're seeing all of this sort of really interesting innovation when it comes to, to branding. And we're seeing brand personalities being crafted in more, I think, nuanced and, 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 uh, and complex ways than we had originally anticipated. And that's really, again, as we're talking about sort of the, the nuanced sort of brand personalities, that's really the arena of small brands. And so 
Mm -hmm. If we're moving from big brands to small brands, of course, there's these different considerations, but the fundamentals really remain the same. The fundamentals really are about sort of harnessing sort of the, these deep truths about human nature and really finding ways to resonate with that, that target market. So it's really my hope that the content in the book will really be especially useful for these sort of new up and coming brands. Mm, I love that. I have two more questions, but before I ask them, where can people find more out about you and about the book? Yeah, so everything is on my website. It's neuroscienceof.com. So I have a couple blogs there. I post pretty regularly. Um, you can sign up to my my uh, newsletter and, and get those. It's all free and, and never spammy or anything like that. And so, uh, yeah, that'd be the best place to, to find me. And all my social media is there as well. So I'm on Twitter at Matt Johnson is me and then on LinkedIn at Matt Johnson is me as well. Amazing. So first of my final two questions, my audience is an audience of learners. They are constantly learning. So I always love to ask my guests, when you are setting out to learn something new, what is your strategy? Ooh, it's a great question. I think one of the most important things I've been, I've been reading about this a lot lately is sort of establishing that beginner's mind context. So it's this sort of very ancient uh, sort of Zen term. I forget the exact koan, I'll probably butcher it, but Essentially, in the expert's mind, there's like no possibilities. In the beginner's mind, there's infinite possibilities. And so as we get older, as we establish knowledge and specialization, that does sort of ossify what we think we know about the world. And so I think as we're learning something new, it's really important to just try and establish that, that openness to new experience, that openness to knowledge, um, you know, drop the assumptions, drop that real sort of critical lens, at least at the onset, of course, our prefrontal cortices are these great critical thinkers, but sort of turning that off slightly so we can be open to the experiences. Um, I think that's really, really important. Something that I, I definitely struggle with, but I think that's what I would try and encourage any, any early learners to do. Yeah. Amazing. And if you could plant a seed of knowledge in everybody that is watching or listening this, what would you want everybody to know? The seed, so not any sort of specific piece of knowledge, but if I just had a general seed to plant, I would say that human behavior, human psychology, human neuroscience is just incredibly rich. I mean, just as we think we understand something as simple as human perception, we're learning you know, new things on, on a weekly basis. I mean, it's just incredibly deep, incredibly nuanced. And it really is the, the sort of final frontier. I mean, we thought that was the final frontier as we're doing space exploration. And now I think the final frontier really is the brain. And there's just so much to learn and explore. And I think the great thing, especially for your audience members, is that really everything we come to understand about the human brain, everything we come to understand about human psychology has application within the world of brands. So there's a lot of elements of business that you know are basically computation. If you go to accounting, it's not a whole lot of, of humanity in accounting. I love my accountant friends, but you know we're, we're just kind of punching numbers there. But if we get into the world of branding and marketing, I mean, this is really a very human enterprise. And so uh, just to, to plant that seed that, that human experience and sort of human psychology is just so rich and so multifaceted. Mic drop. Dr. Matt Johnson, thank you so much for being on The Brian Garvey Show. I appreciate your time and sharing your genius with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's such a blast to chat with you, Kay. I hope you enjoyed that conversation as much as I do. I love bringing you guests who are on the forefront of this intersection between psychology and branding. That is the intent of this show. Highly recommend picking up Branding Means Business. It is a fantastic read. It is a book that I wish that I had written myself because it's talking about the enduring psychological ways that we can attract our ideal customers and honestly add to the bottom line, make branding an asset in our business. If you enjoyed this episode, please take a moment and leave me a review. It helps other smart entrepreneurs, smart humans like yourself benefit from these incredible guests and conversations, and it means so much. Thank you in advance. I will see you on our next episode.